Now, our struggle in South Africa, in, uh, from the time when the British arrived, what we would refer as the wars of resistance. What happened was that when we were fighting against wars of, of resistance or wars of disposition, we were defending our land. We were fighting for what wa was being uh, stolen from us, our land. They came and uh, destroyed uh, or wanting to destroy our culture, our traditions. Now, who did they find here? They found us here. There's no white men who came carrying from their ships their land that they're saying they're owning today. Now, what is critical again is that when uh, we were fighting with them, we were fighting with them dividedly as tribal groupings. But later, we, the kings, we, the chiefs, we, the traditional leaders, formed what we called the ANC. At that time, in 1912, we created what we call uh, the South African Native National Congress. It had two houses, the upper house and the house of commons. The, the upper house, it was the house of the royals. All of the, the, the kings and the chiefs were represented in that house. And there was the lower house of the commons. The lower house of the commons, it is what you see today in the ANC, where you'd find the president, where you find the, the deputy president, where you find the secretary general as, as the way in the national executive. What we said to them was, was that we are giving you the mandate as the kings and the, the chiefs, or the traditional leaders of this area. We met, now the ANC at that time, it was not the ANC of what we would refer in 1912 of uh, uh, South Africa. We would have the South African Native National Congress with open and stroke uh, and the close bracket South Africa of Zambia, of uh, 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 Tanganyika, of the Congo, of uh, Namibia, what we all, all of us would have all the representatives and uh, the kings and the chiefs came from all these regions of, of Africa. They came together under one umbrella in Bloemfontein, uh, 1912, January the 8th. And then even the rent or the venue, it, it was, the money came from the Swazis who contributed to make sure that they pay for the venue. You see, it was us who was responsible for that. So, so, so when we gave them the mandate, the mandate was go and get the land, meaning get to go and fight peacefully for the land that was stolen from us. Restore our cultures, restore our traditions. Mandates, let me repeat the mandate. Go and get the, 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 the land that has been stolen from us. Restore the traditions and the dignities of our Africans by, give, by getting back the land that was stolen. At that time, the British created what we call the Union of South Africa, where they excluded black people. That's why a lot of people don't understand the union building. The union building, those domes that you see there, they don't represent any person of the color of our skins. Those domes, they represent the British or the English and the Afrikaners. We are not anywhere there. If we are to say we are celebrating the existence of union building, it means we are, we are celebrating something that is not representing us or including us as the Africans. According to the agreements of the Ferenaching agreement, they agreed themselves what we called the anglo boer War. Anglo stands for English, Boer stands for Afrikaners. They agreed. That's how they created that union building. So it excludes us. So our, our mandate, just to go back again, our mandate was to say, 
to the ANC at that time, the South African Native National Congress, get the land that was sold, negotiate with these people. What happened is that when we were negotiating with them, it was a passive resistance. By so doing, they did not want to listen to us. The second phase of our struggle changed from passive resistance to radical resistance. That's when the Youth League, Mandela's and them, they came in in the 40s. The defense campaigns, we continue. Another third phase of our struggle was when the ANC was banned in 1960, when they killed people in Sharpeville for, for marching peacefully against the passes. Uh, we then moved to the third phase of our struggle. The third phase was taking up arms against the then government because the organizations that were peaceful were now being silenced. They were banned in 1960. Now, why I'm talking about this is that the kings and the chiefs send people to go to undergo arms uh, military training to undergo a military training in, in, in areas of Africa. What is those countries? You would find Congo would have, uh, would at that time, the chief representative, it was called Zaire. We have Angola. All those African countries in Tanganyika, everybody went there. Now, why did they go there? Historically, historically, is that we are Bantu people, Bantu people. We originate from the Congo. It was not by default. It was not by mistake. For them to go to, to, to Congo or to go to uh, Angola, because according to the demarcation, according to the border of our forefathers, before Berlin Conference, Angola was part of the Congo. Zambia was part of the Congo. Zimbabwe was part of the Congo. You go to Gabon, you go to Cameroon, you go to up in Ivory Coast, it's part of Congo. We had uh, the uh, Baza Congo, you know, we had only one kingdom in the continent. Everybody paid allegiance to it, it was in the Congo. So, so, so everything started, the, the Bantu migration and or the Bantu people came from the Congo. You can say you are better off because we are we are being brainwashed. You are you are being 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 made a black British or a black French or whatever you want to call yourself. But the fact that remains is that you are a person who comes from the Congo. You like it or not? And I'm emphasizing that you like you can have more money because you have sold your soul but you come from the Congo, you like it or not. That's where we come from, all of us, as the Bantu. So as we're migrating down, because we were looking for food, we're looking for greener pastures, we were, we were hunting. That's why you can find the people that are being named today as the Koi and the Sands. There you find them in the Congo, you find them in Rwanda. You find them in Tanzania. Now, our art, as today it has been perceived that uh, people who, who do or who write in the caves are the Khoisans is not true. That is the art of the Africans by showing animals. But it is a culture that has been uh, uh, well entrenched in the Bantu people. It's our culture, it's not the Khoisan culture. Khoisan is just a small minute, it's a clan. But we are the majority of this continent. We are the owners of this continent. And all of us, we knew that we pay allegiance to one kingdom in the Congo. The white men came and divided the whole continent into themselves. They had a meeting, the Bismarck. They had a meeting where they decided to say it's a Berlin conference, where they said that portion will belong to who, that portion will belong to who. They destroyed our cultures today. We think we are white. 
we think we are we are better than the other Africans. The borders were, were, were introduced by the very same colonizers. Who are the colonizers? People who change your way of doing things, your culture, your traditions. These are the people who destroyed you. You might even find out that a person who lives beyond your border, it might, it, it might be your, your, your uncle, it might be your grandfather or your grandmother or your aunt. You know, when I was in Angola, I was uh, at the VIP lodge. One person who's responsible for protocol is a protocol officer at the VIP lodge. They were talking and pointing at me as I was, I was talking to some other dignitaries. They were waiting for the plane, for the SAA to come. This man came to me shaking. He says to me, Excellency, do you mind if I borrow your passport? I said, no problem. Why? Is it a problem? He says, no, 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 no. There's something that I'm seeing here. And then I gave him my passport. He says, ah, you are Khadebe. My mother is a Kadebe. He's from Zaire, in Angola, here in Zaire. What I was seeing, that's why I wanted to see your passport. I was seeing my uncle speaking. You look exactly like my, my, my uncle, my, my, my mother's brother. Same. The, the, the structure of your teeth, same. Your walk, you, the way you laugh as you're talking to the ministers there, same. And, you know, I looked at you when you were working, you were, you were preparing tea. I said, I can't believe this. I remember up to today, even in Angola, they refer him as, as my nephew. Even the time I, I, I went again, he came to, to, to welcome me. Even when I was at the meeting at the headquarters of MPLA, he came. He says, uncle, uncle, I came to say hi to you. He says, when I took a photo, I showed my mother, you know, the video, they could not believe at home. So I'm saying there is a possibility that all of us are interrelated. Now, there's a problem in Africa. And that problem was created by the very same colonizers that I'm talking about. They take the names of people, they make them surnames. They never understood the structure of us Africans the way we speak. When I say my name is Khadebe or my name is Bukwa and my father is, is Khadebe, they think that Khadebe is a surname. That is where the mistake is. Then they then conclude to say, okay, this one is a, is a Hadeb. But culturally, we have, we have a surname. And that surname, it comes from the origin. What is the origin is where the first person who gave us life. That is the surname. Now remember, according to our history, is that in Africa, the first person who gave life to Bantu people, he emerged from the waters. He emerged from the river. I don't know if uh, 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 you would know that part of the history. And that person, he came out of the river next to the reeds, wearing a leopard skin. And people, after giving birth to us, People referred to say he was the king of the reeds in the current Zulu language or the Ngoni language because there's no Zulu language. It's called Ngoni language. Uh, they say Ngosio Mlaka or Ngosio Mlaka. It comes from that origin. When you go to the Sudanese, they say the same history. When you go to the Ethiopians of uh, Ambo, uh, they say the same story. They said, our father came from the river. Now that is the same concept that was now used in the Bible of Moses. To say he came from the, 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 the river, uh, Pharaoh found him, or what? Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh's wife. 
we came before Pharaoh in, in Nubia, what we would refer today uh, as Egypt. It was the Nubians who, who, who created, who built those pyramids. It was Bantu people who, who built those pyramids. I don't know if you know the history. It is us who built those, those, those pyramids. It was not the Arabs. The Arabs don't even respect that history there. Because why? They sell things in front of those pyramids. They sell things in front of those graves there. They are an invasion force. Now we started from Nubia. Nubia, it's us, the, the Bantu people who lives there. That's the history, you can't change it. Africa, it is us. Now at the other side of the Nubian side, there was floods. We ended up moving up where it is today called Egypt. Go to Egypt, you'll see. Go to, to Europe, you'll see. Go to Indonesia. Indonesia, it is us, the Bantu people who are there, the first inhabitants of Asia. I have a proof, I can give it to you. You go, you go to, to, to Europe, it is us. We are the creation of the Vatican Church. The first the first prophets, the first uh, 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 Saint Paul or whatever you'll see, they are Africans, they are Bantu like me and you. It's us that are having a direct contact with God. Show me uh, 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 Caucasians that are prophets like ourselves. Look at the history of uh, the cradle of humankind, it points at the Congo. We come from there. The question is, why Congo? Yes, I hear people say uh, the Garden of Eden is in Ethiopia, but I think we, we need to revisit that history again. Why? And that Jesus, you know that uh, the very same story of Jesus is black. I don't know if you know the story. He lived in Abyssinia. Where is Abyssinia? It's in Africa, in Ethiopia. Who is the Ethiopians? Who are the first inhabitants of, of Ethiopia in Abyssinia? There is no Addis Ababa. They call it Mfimfinia. Because why? The first inhabitants were the Bantu people. Jesus lived there. Why when Jesus was born, he had to uh, fire Egypt up to Ethiopia? And then that's where, you know, when you look at the history of Christianity, the first uh, 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 you know, what do they call it? Scriptures of Christianity. I don't know if you know that you find them in, uh, in, in Ethiopia. 3,000 years before Christ. It's there. I visited, I could not believe when I was there. So I'm saying, uh, we are the direct descendants of God. What happened to Joseph? Where did, who, who was Joseph to, to be made, to be made one of the very important people in the kingdom? Not because of his dream. It's because they could see the bloodline. Look at Israel today. How far is it from Africa, Israel? Who are the original Hebrews? I'm, you know, I'm, try, I'm, try, I'm trying to put facts on the table. We are the direct uh, descent. We are the Hebrews. They always say the Hebrews, they come from Ethiopia. They don't want to say, uh, because they will give us credits, because they don't want to say they come from Congo. When you fast for seven days without eating, what is that you see? We have a, immediately we have a connection with God. Why? Ask anybody to do it. They'll never. But because what we have done is that we have lost it embrace something that we don't know. Now, what we need to do is to go back to the basics and know who is God and know how do you relate with God.
then you would understand who you how how important you are in this world